Um, thanks for having me back again, and kudos to Montgomery Bell, the community here. Um, I am very aware that this is a difficult topic. Um, part of the reason that um, I've worked so hard in the last three years to get this training into as many heads and hearts as possible in Davidson County um, is because the training approaches the problem of child sexual abuse from a public health perspective. And I know that when I was here a year ago, I, I spoke a bit about that. Um, but just to remind you, um, you know, our country has this long history of um, figuring out something um, that is causing injury or illness or even death. Um, so you can think about clean water, vaccinations, my favorite is seatbelts. Um, and what happens is that once the problem is understood, um, adults tend to um, uh, acquire knowledge and use their own ingenuity and communities to make changes that result in incidents of illness or injury or death declining. So seatbelts for me are, are my um, number one choice because I was born in 1916 and cars didn't have seatbelts in them. Um, this training um, really encourages communities of adults um, to, to um, sit with the content um, at, through a public health lens. Um, we, I'm, I am certainly um, keenly aware that the topic is painful, um, really difficult for most people to even contemplate for very long, um, and yet, uh, as you'll see here today, uh, the rates of child sexual abuse in this country um, correlate to what we would consider a public health crisis. Uh, it's a uh, nationally s accepted statistic is one in 10 children before they're 18. Um, so let me tell you what we're gonna do today. Um, I'm gonna walk you through, I'm gonna make sure that what we cover here today is um, a definition of what is sexual abuse. Um, Oh, I'm on the wrong page of my notes. So what is sexual abuse? What can adults do in any setting to prevent child sexual abuse? Um, what might you see in a child who has been or is being abused? What, what, what are the signs and symptoms that you might be able to observe in their behavior or presentation? And then what do you do um, if, as an adult, you are on the receiving end of a disclosure from a child who's decided you're trustworthy and they are going to tell you what's happened or is happening. What do you do if you discover that sexual abuse is occurring? Um, and what do you do if you just strongly suspect it? So we're gonna get through all those things today. Um, the way in which we're gonna do that is this presentation, me talking, hopefully a little bit of discussion um, amongst the group. Um, I have uh, downloaded a condensed um, a, a video from the nonprofit out of South Carolina that publishes the stewards curriculum. Typically the training runs for two hours and we're going to walk through this information in an hour. Um, but I made the decision to download this 18, 19 minute video because it, it follows along. Uh, it is it is exactly what you would get in the first part of the training. Um, and that is that you're gonna hear from eight adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, both genders. You'll see immediately um, lots of different um, socioeconomic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, as were the people who abused them. So rather than me stand up here and give you definitions and maybe tell you some anecdotes, um, I think this is a much more powerful way um, to um, help you all get up the learning curve around what this looks like, uh, what's the immediate impact on a child, why kids don't tell, um, what's the long-term impact, and then towards the end, uh, a little bit of discussion about what people, what, what is proven to decrease risk to kids anywhere. Um, and so then we'll have a little bit, uh, I've, I've, I, I'm gonna go back over some of um, those, those points that are made in the video. Um, and we'll finish up. Okay, so 
just going to read this. I really don't like it when people stand in front of a group of educated folks and read a PowerPoint, but sometimes it helps to hear it. What is child sexual abuse? Any sexual act between an adult and a minor or between two minors when one exerts power over the other, forcing, coercing, or persuading a child to engage in any type of sexual act. It also includes non-contact acts such as exhibitionism, exposure to pornogra pornography, voyeurism, and communicating in a sexual manner by phone or the internet. It is a traumatic experience for any child or teen, and it is considered a criminal act in every state in the country. So quickly, um, what do we know about uh, substantiated um, child sexual abuse in this country? Um, as I said earlier, one in ten children, um, one in, I say children, and I mean ch infants, toddlers, uh, children, and teens, um, one in ten kids will be sexually abused or assaulted by the time they're 18. Um, the next statistic that's important and sometimes a real tough one for folks is that in 90% of substantiated cases, uh, victims and or their parents or primary caregivers know and trust the abuser. Um, so it truly isn't the creepy guy in the raincoat. 40%, um, and this is a statistic that often surprises people who work with um, teens, and 40% of substantiated cases in the country, the offender is another, and usually a, a slightly older, but certainly more powerful um, youth. And then finally, um, in 80% of these cases, the abuse occurs in one-to-one -one physical places or situations. And so don't expect you to remember all that right now, and we'll, we'll refer back to these four statistics. Um, what stewards, um, what stewards teaches uh, is that there are five things that have been studied um, and proven to reduce the risk that a child will be sexually abused. So what's the first one? The first one is, is a good part of what we're going to do here today. Um, it's, it's for adults to learn the facts. The second one is to minimize opportunity. So you think about that 80% of cases occur in isolated, one-on-one -on -one situations or places where the activity can't be observed or interrupted. So minimizing the op opportunity for that to happen is really key and very powerful in terms of, of preventing or reducing risk to kids. The third step is to talk about it, um, to talk about it with other adults, to talk about it with kids, and to start early doing that, and then to do it all the time. And that's how we learn to put our seatbelts on, y'all. The fourth one is to recognize signs and symptoms in children so that if you um, are in a position where a child would be reliant on you or um, if you're simply an important adult in his or her life, um, that if you're noticing signs or symptoms, you can step in and take a closer interest and, and communicate to that child that you're available if indeed they have something that they need to tell you. And then the final step is um, how to respond um, appropriately, responsibly, should you get a disclosure, you discover um, sexual abuse, um, or you just have strong suspicions. So I'm going to get this going, and it runs about 18 minutes. I was the bright blonde hair and blue sailor suits and you do what you're supposed to do. We had the dogs in the river and homemade biscuits and 
life was wonderful. Uh, Fisher was the athletic trainer for the football team. What a great place for a pedophile. I hold the school much more responsible than Fisher, you know, not because they have deep pockets, because I think they just willfully let children get hurt. I was born to a schizophrenic mother. Um, she was not able to care for me because of her mental illness. So I was placed with my aunt. My aunt was a very strict disciplinary. I grew up in church. Um, I would say it became very physically um, abusive. At the age of four, I started to be sexually abused by some adult cousins who were also in the household. Margaret Holser. I am a two-time Olympian, three-time Olympic medalist. So I was abused from five to seven years old um, by a good friend of mine's father. I was going to their house on a regular basis for play dates. They were coming to my house on a regular basis. So this was a man that I trusted, that you know, my parents trusted. My dad uh, moved back and forth from the United States to Guatemala so he pr can provide for the family. And in the, the Latin American community, as we just tend to, to live in a large cluster of people. And um, when my mom used to go out with my other aunts to go shopping, they left my older cousins there to stay with us. And it was this one specific cousin. Um, but it was him specifically that, that kind of targeted me. As a child, you don't think of, of adults as manipulative or, or hurtful or anything like that. But I can tell you that the first time I met this man, I had concerns about him, and yet we continued to allow him to be a part of our lives. And part of that was because there was a professional relationship. He was on staff with my husband um, at, at our church. Well, there was a cousin, a female cousin of mine that used to come and visit often, and it just started off as little small events leading up to much larger events. You know, she would have me to touch her or she would try to touch me. The other abuse um, started around age seven, and um, my mom, she had a live-in boyfriend at the time who was a firefighter. He would sneak into my room in the middle of the night, and initially, I thought I was a dream. What was more traumatic about the experience for me was feeling helpless. It was, I, I would beg my parents not to leave me at this, at this house, but they would go out for the weekend, and so um, they, they would leave me there as, as a babysitter. And I would know it was gonna happen, and I would just be so angry, and, uh, and then everybody would go to sleep and I would just wait for him to come. I grew up in the picture-perfect family. I was called the debutante Miss America. I was the first Miss America that they ever brought a family up on stage. My father continued to sexually violate children and teenagers until he died at age 75. You know, I was a regular kid, you know, my Unfortunately for us, my parents, uh, they didn't know that they were bringing someone who was a pedophile in. He was the, actually the teenage son of our, our babysitter. I still cannot even say what really happened other than he sex had sexual acts with me and had me perform, but I still can't say it. I mean, I don't know if I ever will. I feel I had to free myself from feeling guilty, uh, feeling responsible, like I was dirty, um, who would want me, you know, it's all these things are in your head. How could someone hurt me like this if I have any type of value? How could somebody do this to me and care about me in any way, shape, or form? I really must be nothing. Out of that situation was born uh, of just a deep anger in me, a resentment towards adults, towards caretakers, the people in charge. And, um, and I also didn't understand that he didn't have the right to do this to me. I had a fear of saying no 
to people because I felt like if I said no, they were just gonna take it anyway. I became very bitter, very cold, very angry at the world. I felt like I didn't have any choices after that moment. I'm not who you think I am at all. I'm a really bad person. I was gonna kill myself. And that's what I feel that was taken from me. Um, my virginity, uh, my youth. You're never the same after that. There's a part of me from this that can give love, but has trouble really receiving deep love because I never feel that I'm really worthy of it. I held a lot of resentment toward my mom for many years because I could not understand how she didn't know. I could not understand how you didn't know that this man was sneaking out of your bed and into mine. My mother telling me that uh, we were going to have a family member that was going to move with us to the United States because he needed to um, raise some money. He was trying to get his life together. And then I remember coming home from high school and it was that cousin that had, you know, raped me when I was a kid. Nobody outside of the home should know what's going on inside the home. And it's a terrible, terrible belief. It goes so far even to the extent that the perpetrator is often protected just so that it doesn't get out. My mother walked down the hallway one night. He'd been in my room for maybe a half hour. And all of a sudden, I, I heard footsteps coming down. I could hear the first step and then the second step very, very, very slowly, and then the third step and she was now about 12 feet from my door and I waited to hear another step and it was just, it was a dramatic moment when everything stopped for all three of us. All three of us knew exactly what each one of us was thinking and knew. It's the only time I ever felt my father afraid. He, he just stopped and I thought, it's going to be over. She's going to come in. And we waited for that dramatic moment and then I heard a step up the steps and up the steps and up the steps. And I knew she would never come through that door. And I knew she would never, ever come to help me. Maybe she just couldn't deal with it, so she just put it somewhere and, and wouldn't think about it. But I do believe she made a decision. I, I believe she made a choice. And she didn't choose me. Going into camping trips, I knew, you know, I'm gonna have a blast until nighttime comes, and then he's gonna make me take my clothes off and lay in bed while he touches me. She um, decided to, to make me touch her, and she, of course, me, and she um, ultimately wanted me to lick her, and um, so I had to do that, and I did that, and, that was one of the worst memories I have. It was a memory that I um, I tucked away for a very long time. I remember being 16 years old and him pinning me against the wall. And he said something like, I'm going to show you what I should have showed you those years ago and try to do it again. There were many occasions that he um, tried to force himself onto me, um, make me watch pornographic videos and try to make me do the things that were in the videos. She said, you said he pried you open. I said, I did say that, Mother, because they're writing that he abused me. And that's a very easy word to dismiss. If I say he pried me open, which he did, that's a visual that helps people to better understand what he did to me thousands of times over 13 years. For some reason, as a child, you don't speak up about those things. I, can't, I don't know why. I try, I, I try to think back, like, why didn't I just say what was going on? And I really don't know why I didn't just come out and say that that was happening. I, maybe it's because I wasn't so sure 
that it was right or wrong. I just knew that I didn't like it, and I didn't want it to happen anymore. What words would a sixth grader use to, uh, may I have some coffee? And by the way, my, this teacher put me in his mouth. But I remember when she thought something, she called me in her, bed, her and my dad's bedroom, she went, don't you let nobody touch you. Well, it had already happened. And the way she said it made me feel like, now that I've already let it happen, how can I tell you, because you'd be mad at me. My sister is four years younger than me, so I never wanted him to touch her. I could have gone to my grandmother's house and stayed. You know, I had teachers at school that really cared about me that I could have gone to, but I chose to stay and endure what I was enduring because I figured if I left that he would then turn on her. And it wasn't like some creepy guy with a, with a trench coat on. It's our babysitter's son. He was funny, he had a Porsche. He didn't come asking for help or anything. He came offering to help. He was always a part of the game. He was very charismatic. People liked being around him. A lot of talk and Mr. Cool. Very respectful. Kind of like a grandfather type. If we were playing tag, he was playing. If we were climbing trees, he was climbing trees with us. A real upstanding, you know, good kid. He was a natural leader. He was from my community. He made himself the person who solved problems for people. He'd worked with children all of his life. I drank all, every day. And so it's really hard to be a s junior in high school drinking every day and function. When you hold something for 26 years, I mean, never tell a soul, uh, even though I could bury it, it still would just always come up. And when I finally did it, my body just fell apart. I started getting sick all the time. I started um, having weird headaches. I started having getting just really sick all the time and eventually to the point where I couldn't stay conscious. At the age of 16, I became a, a teenage mom Without any resources to provide for myself, I could not provide for my daughter. I sent her to stay with her father and I was devastated because I felt that not only did my mom not raise me, now I am repeating that. And I became suicidal. I was very um, depressed. And so when this guy that I met at the mall offered me a new life, I wanted to run, and I wanted a new life. The, uh, the pimp came back after a couple of hours, and he said he had to go over the rules with me. And he said things like, I have to take $200 an hour, talk to this kind of guy, that kind of guy. He gave me a new name, a new birthday. And you know, when I look back too, I think, uh, I kind of went through a lot of women, too, just to always prove uh, for myself, my sexuality and um, things like that. So for me, that was my coping mechanism, to emotionally shut down and just expect the worst from everybody. I've been married for 10 years now. And it's not until now, it took me 10 years to figure out that sex is not just something you do you you know sex is a, is a special bond and somebody just took that from me generally in our culture adults rights trump children so we believe the adults over the children and we um, tend to think more about the impact on the adult than on the child. We think about the disruption to this person who harmed the child's life, career, and reputation more than the trauma to the child. Law enforcement is never going to investigate, investigate their way out of these type of crimes, these crimes against children. It's only through prevention that we can help stem the tide. We are going to have to help 
people in our world understand how trauma impacts not just the child, but without treatment and without intervention, how it really impacts almost every social ill that we spend so much money on every day in this country. Um, if we begin to have policies in our churches, in our youth serving organizations, that both educates the adults as well as educates the kids and it creates a, a different kind of social norm that is gonna make say that this is something that our, our community cares about kids and our community cares about stopping sexual abuse. Corporations have a huge role in how these children are viewed, how they view sex objects, and they need to take a stand to make sure that children continue to be children and they're not portrayed as sexual objects, they're not portrayed as making them a sexual item or being sexualized. We also need a clear message, which we are not giving now in our society, that it is not okay for adults to sexually use their own or anybody else's children. You know, this, this does happen. Abuse happens. It happened in 1950. It happened yesterday. Um, it can unravel and cause lots of damage, or you can stop it, interrupt it, and limit the collateral damage. So, back to your original question, why was I willing to do this? You know, if you can stop the collateral damage here, as opposed to 18 years later, that makes a huge difference. And you, if you spare one child, I mean, people don't have a clue in the ripples from one job. So you stop one source of ripples. I mean, that is huge. Escape. Thank you. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to spend some time talking about how um, adults can individually and in groups um, prevent child sexual abuse from occurring in the first place. And while we go through this, I put this slide back up here because. Um, these principles are based on these statistics, um, and particularly these two. 90% of children know their abuser, or their parents know and trust their abuser, and 80% of abuse occurs in isolated, one-on-one -on -one places or situations, okay? So if we're gonna think about uh, what's the universal precaution then, based on these statistics, and it's this. It is really simple. It is no one-to-one -one in a place or in a situation where the activity cannot be observed or interrupted. Um, kids, we all know, we all need one-to-one, -one, and kids need one-to-one -one time, right? It's important. Um, it's a large part of, of um, how they grow and thrive. What stewards and PCAT and the other folks in our coalition recommend um, is that when a place like MBA is going to have situations where there might be one-on-one -on -one interaction, whether it's between an adult and one of the kids or between kids, um, that as much as possible, it occurs in a place that is open and observable or those two individuals might not know when another person would come in, walk by, whatever. So it's interruptible, right? Um, 
And I'm, I'm going to stop here for a minute because I think oftentimes when people come through the training and even just this shorter version of, of the testimony from these adult survivors, there's a, a kind of common like, whoa, yee, how do you trust anybody? Um, and so I want to um, make the point that this is not about not trusting people or places. This is not about you all as a community not trusting each other. It is really simply recommending that you become more knowledgeable. You put uh, a set of um, universal rules or policies and procedure or a code of conduct in place. And you raise the expectation that everyone is going to abide by that. And what that does is it obviously keeps kids safer, but it keeps the adults um, who are caring for them or care about them safer. Um, it is a great way to be able to hold each other accountable. You know, you're in a rush, I don't know, the room's not air conditioning, whatever. You're going to take a kid to go discuss this. You are not a pedophile, but it gives your colleague an opportunity to say, whoa, 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 do you, like, you know. It's, it's not an accusation then, it is more about this is simply how we do things at MBA. And if in a rush um, or bad day you are witnessing a colleague who seems to be in any way pushing that set of policy and procedure or norms, you can be helpful. You can see it, state what you're saying and what you'd rather have happen and you go on. And it makes everyone safer. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to save some time at the end for a little bit of conversation. So if you think back to those five steps, this is step number two. This is minimizing opportunity. Step number three, and this is really all I'm going to say about it because that's what we're doing here today, um, is that adults have the conversation. People talk about child sexual abuse. People talk with other adults and talk with kids about it and then you keep talking about it. All right, so what would you all see in a, in a student here who might have been abused or is being abused? You can read this list, and this list would be, so there are physical signs of sexual abuse, but most of the times they're not observed. Um, and, and what people most often see are these emotional or behavioral symptoms of someone who has survived sexual abuse. Um, and obviously this list um, would suggest a wide variety of potential um, problems in a child's life or, or stress, um, but they are always also present um, in some combination um, for kids who are being sexually abused or have been abused. And so when you see it, um, the task is to step in and not to say, you seem a little down and your grades are falling, are you being sexually abused? But rather, to communicate in whatever way is normal and natural for you and that kid, um, that you're observing something in them um, that is worrisome and that you care about them, and if there's anything happening in their life that is causing them to be sad or angry or afraid, you're available to talk about it. Okay, and so uh, here's step five. Um, and this is, what's, this, this, this is a list that captures what is, uh, really now considered best practice by most people um, doing this kind of work. Um, and that is that if, if a child decides they're going to tell you um, that they have been or they're being sexually abused, um, the number one rule is to try to stay calm and ideally to try and be quiet. Um, when we are quiet, we um, have a better opportunity to have like uh, a neutral face um, and kids are great you know interpreters of our non-verbal communication so if you can simply be quiet and stay calm 
um, you may end up getting more information than you would have otherwise. Um, but what goes along with that um, is not to ask any qu leading questions. If you're going to ask questions, they really need to be open-ended. And, and, so, and that gets to um, a bigger point that I want to make. If, if you are on the end of a disclosure, it is not your job to figure out whether it's true, what happened, who was involved. That is not, that is not what the task is at hand. Your task um, in the role of the recipient of the disclosure is to try and create a space and provide that kid uh, the experience of telling an adult what's happening and having that adult receive it in a way that doesn't make the child feel worse than he or she always does. Does that make sense? So if you can be quiet, stay calm, not ask leading questions, and then finally, and it's not saying that, that you have to be completely silent, if you are going to say anything, you want to um, make statements that are supportive. So thank you for telling me this. Thank you for trusting me with it. Um, it is not your fault, and we will get you the help you need so it doesn't happen again. Um, and, and, and acknowledging that it, it does take a fair amount of courage for anyone to make a disclosure about sexual abuse. And then finally, um, what, what the law says in Tennessee is that if you receive a disclosure, you are the mandated reporter. And what that means is you call law enforcement and the child and child protective services. So very quickly, what happens if you discover um, that sexual abuse are, is occurring? What happens if you get information secondhand, but it's credible? Um, and, and, and you believe it to be true, um, you make the report. You make the same report you would make as if you'd heard it from the alleged victim or victims, right? Um, and this is what happens when you make that report. If you want to be prepared and well prepared to make a report, um, then you need to know child's name, where he or she lives, what is alleged to have happened, just the facts. Um, if you've seen any signs in, in the kid um, that might suggest that they are stressed that way. Um, and to think about whether it's a situation that, that where potentially um, the alleged victim um, could be, again, injured, right? OK. Um, suspicion, again, in Tennessee, is reason to make a report to Child Protective Services or law enforcement. Um, and if you don't feel like you have enough suspicion or you haven't seen enough um, to warrant a report, but, but what you're seeing is making you un uncomfortable, you're seeing an adult or an older kid who's pushing the rules, pushing physical boundaries or emotional boundaries, um, then what's recommended is bystander intervention. Um, and we talk about bystander intervention a lot. My guess is you all talk about it with kids here. It's certainly something that's been talked about on college campuses. Bystander intervention is not simply about removing the kid from potential harm. Bystander intervention is about saying to the individual who you are observing violate boundaries or rules, saying to them, essentially, I see what you're doing, it, you have to stop, and then you move on. You're not making an accusation, but you are in the moment letting that person know that, that you see them, okay? Um, that's it. So what time is it? Who's got the time meal? It's three now? It's three now, okay. Um, So let me say this, uh, and then I'd, I'd love to get some takeaways or have some of you offer up thoughts to each other. Um, in the wake of the Brentwood Academy um, lawsuit, 
I have been in a lot of private schools, just like MBA. Um, and there is just this growing momentum and consensus in those communities um, that it's okay to talk about this, it's okay to come together around it, to ask questions, um, and you know, to take a good look at what you have in place and re revise it if you feel like that's necessary. Um, the point about stewards, the point about this training uh, is that if you get a group of knowledgeable adults together and they feel comfortable and empowered to ask questions, um, to make change, to be honest about where they are and where they'd like to go, um, kids and all the adults are just simply safer. And I think the final thing I would say, so, so in saying that about these other schools, I've had a number of them say, if you're making your rounds, Carrie, in the next year or two, we're happy to offer up what we've done, for starters at least, or what we've gone back and changed. It's, you know, we're happy to share it with our peers in the private school community in Nashville. So, so that's a resource. Um, and I would say, uh, I guess what I want to do is to end with um, what, what I try and make a point to say to everybody, which is that there are a couple of things. One, if you make those changes, if you start to have more conversation amongst yourselves and with the kids here, who I'd really encourage you to be having the conversation with parents. You cannot imagine the gift that is for a teacher, I like to say teachers and preachers, to give to a parent to say, this is something we all need to be talking about. We're talking about it here. You all need to be talking about it at home. There are resources we're talking about with your kid. You need to talk about it with your kid. So often, um, that's, that's, that's really what a parent would need um, to be more present, maybe to make some changes, um, and maybe even prevent their child from being harmed. It is something that I personally and professionally think should be celebrated. So to the extent that you all have a code of conduct for both faculty and staff and volunteers as well as kids, um, and yes, it is always liability driven, um, this is the kind of thing that you, you adopt as a code of conduct, as a set of values, and you celebrate it in a prideful way because that's how this kind of change occurs. Well, golly, if they're doing it at MBA, what are they doing at my church? Or, you know, at Vacation Bible School? Or what exactly is happening on this Little League team? What's this all about, right? It really is a way of... of um, continuing to disseminate this kind of knowledge and giving people um, sometimes the confidence they need, particularly individually, to start to ask some questions or look more carefully at whatever a situation is. So, um, let me go, let me go back to those. What, we've got a few minutes left. Would a few of you like to offer up your thoughts? what's resonated strongly with you, or what you're not clear about. Yes. What would you recommend to signal to our students, just generally, that you're open to being someone who is that? To make those statements. I don't know that you, I don't know that there's necessarily in any one way to signal that. Uh, I mean, the, the easiest way to signal that is, is verbally. Is, and, and that, you know, gets back to step three. Talk about it. That's what that's about. That's the start. That's a good question. Yes. One of the latter speakers, I, uh, I think her name was Rodriguez, she mentioned corporate um, responsibility, and could you give us maybe a, sort of your impressions of where corporate corporations are in terms of 
And I, I assume that meant advertising. And um, what's the status of that awareness? Uh, I can't comment on that because um, it's not something I've looked at. I can tell you personally over the last three years, I've knocked on a lot of um, small and middle-sized local business doors to say, um, you know, this is, a, this is prevalent, and it was much more prevalent 20 years ago. Um, chances are you've got employees here who have been impacted. Chances are you've got a lot of employees who are parents or have children that they love in their lives. So I've tried really hard, like all different ways. I usually, with the, with the corporate sector, try and get at the gift piece of this. Um, whether you're finally allowing someone to, who's survived it in childhood to address it, or you're increasing, you know, an adult's knowledge, um, but it's it's tough in terms of if you're asking. She wasn't speaking about. She's race, talking about race right. exploit through advertising uh, young people. Exactly, and I think we can all come up with examples. I don't have any personal experience with having that conversation with anyone who would have, be in a position to, uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any connection with someone who I personally or professionally could hold accountable. But I think that it, it kind of gets to, like, uh, again, the public health analogy. You know, if you think about advertising alcohol, and certainly I grew up with, you know, all kind the Marlboro Man, right? Lots of advertising um, for behaviors or things that were dangerous. And that has gone away. And that is because those public health movements just continued to become more and more robust. And that's really about adult knowledge and behavior change. So at some point, somebody said, we do not like the Marlboro Man as the cool guy you know, uh, um, role model for teenage boys. Same, same thing. Yep. <coughs> yeah. You can't say this child has become withdrawn and that is a significant change in his behavior um, over the last six weeks and he's just, you know, failed all his, his six-week exams or something. You cannot make the assumption, and this is not suggesting that anyone should, that that is, is happening because uh, the child's being sexual abused. What we're saying is that you, it is really very important to include that in any thinking or planning uh, around an intervention or a conversation given the prevalence of child sexual abuse, um, you know, in any group of kids. You have children here at MBA, if that statistic is correct, who have been or are being sexually abused. Have it on your radar, like put it, like put it on your checklist, right? mom and dad getting a divorce, you know, the, all those things that, that you might think about would uh, cause a child to be stressed to the extent that they would, would develop those kinds of signs and symptoms. It's simply, let's all go ahead and add the, fa that, the idea that maybe they've been sexually abused. No, no. Just that most of, most of, this is a typical list, right? Caroline, would you say this is the kind, if you were to see these behaviors in a teenager, it would be cause for concern and a conversation. And, and what this is simply saying is folks need to be thinking that sexual abuse could be one of the causal factors. You, yeah. Um, to your point about conversation as a community and celebrating.
celebrating that and really create that. Um, just a little food for thought. Sexual predators thrive on silence. Mm -hmm. That is a power tool in creating that experience and perpetuating it. So by creating a community where we talk about it as colleagues or and we let our constituents know we're aware, we're talking about it, we're having conversations, you see us talking about it, you hear us talking about it, you will inadvertently let others know <clears throat> That behavior is not welcome. Well, if there is a pedophile circling around right now, looking at the NBA community, that is indeed. Um, that would be a big red flag for them, and that person would go elsewhere. Exactly. Right. But they have to, we have to have that conversation. We have to create that culture yes. to make those people aware. Of, exactly. This is, this this is, is not, not a safe place for me. That's a safe place for kids and the adults who work there. That's not a safe place for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Statistics incorporate like dating violence as well as yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. There are a lot of questions, so I'm going to just keep going in circles around the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, and it's apropos of the one in ten, does our data go back far enough to be able to say whether there's an increase or a decrease? There is a significant improvement. Okay. Um, however, I will say, so the one in 10 is a national statistic. And for any of you all who are interested, I have all those references um, in Middle Tennessee because I work with a group of, there are five now, five nonprofits in Nashville, and together um, we promote this training. We do it collectively. Um, so the National Children's Alliance, which is our child advocacy center, um, our kids, which is, we're very fortunate to have our kids in, in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. It's a subspecialty um, medical clinic um, where children who, where there's been an a allegation made, can go and have a forensic physical exam. They're part of the partnership and then Nashville Sexual Assault Center. And so if, you, if those folks were here today, they would say, well, that's the national statistic in Middle Tennessee. Our year over your statistics would, would continue to suggest that it's one in four girls and one in seven boys. That's what it looks like here. It's not, it, we're not to one in 10 yet if you're looking at those three different entities' statistics. I'm going to come back here. Was there somebody else? Yes. Yeah, um, I was curious if you had any concrete like, institutional or individual recommendations for meaning good. <clears throat> Prevention or detection of sexual assault or harassment through social media and cell phones and so forth, as that is a harder thing to contain than the individual interaction. Yes, and so you all could have another probably two hour training about that issue. Um, so I'm going to say this is very simplified, but um, if you think about that, no one to one. That makes a cell phone, that makes the internet a potentially, the internet is a potentially dangerous situation where a kid can be one-on-one -on -one engaged in an activity that's not observable and not interruptible. So I think you could start there and, and take those next steps to creating um, some set of norms around it, um, you know, set of best practices for MBA, for kids and adults. Yes. If you were to make a report, I just want to make a practical point of view. If there's a fear that there could be another injury or incident before action is taken, I know that we're not investigators. Do you have a recommendation on that? When you make the report, you make that statement. And you, you explain why that is. So you've got a kid here at school, and you're concerned about him leaving the premises here that day. Is that the kind of scenario you're thinking about? You say that. And, and, that, and then you say, we will keep the child here until you arrive. And if you don't get the kind of response you want, say you've called Child Protective Services, call the police. You can, you know, in that situation, I, I know what I'd recommend is that you make both, two calls. Call both entities. Thank you all. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for having me back.